let's get into the live stream. Hi to everyone who's just joining us. We're just waiting for everyone to make their way here. And happy Ask an Archaeologist Day. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> hey everyone, we're still just waiting for everyone to get into the live stream now. Thank you so much for joining us today from the Trenches to TV live stream. Hello to everyone. We'll just give it one more minute and let everyone get into the live stream. Okay, people are joining bit by bit. We'll just wait a little bit longer. Thank you so much for joining us today. especially on what is Ask an Archaeologist Day. Happy Ask an Archaeologist Day to everyone today. We'll just give it a little more time. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to From Trenches to TV. This is the place to be if you want to get the inside scoop on what life can be like for an archaeologist in the 21st century. My name is Leonie and I'll be hosting today's event and I am a young producer with the Shout Out Loud project run by English Heritage which is all about giving young people a voice in the world of heritage. It's because of a partnership between Shout Out Loud and the Council for British Archaeology that today's event is taking place so thank you to both of those. It's day five in the Festival of Archaeology and today is actually Ask an Archaeologist Day. So we're really lucky that we've got two expert archaeologists on hand that we'll be talking with for the next 15 minutes or so. So the first half of the session is going to be an interactive quiz where you can have a go at asking, uh, answering some of the questions posed by our experts. And in the second half of the session, we'll be doing an audience Q&A. So after having answered some of the questions in the quiz, you can turn those tables right back around and ask the experts themselves some questions. Any questions you think of throughout the session, just pop them in the comments section for this YouTube live video. We'll see what everyone is keen to know and make sure we get answers to as many of your questions as we can. So don't worry about it, just keep popping them in the live stream comments section. We're keen for your feedback as well, and we'll share a link to a survey at the end of the session. So for anyone who completes a survey, you will also be automatically entered into a prize draw worth £50. We'll be sharing a link to the survey right at the end, so do keep a lookout for that if you'd like to help out. And it will influence how we run events like this in the future. Okay, so now to introduce our experts. Dr. Heather Sabir is Senior Historic Property Curator at English Heritage for Stonehenge and other prehistoric sites. She was the curator for archaeology at Guernsey Museum between 1996 and 2003, and then states archaeologist in Guernsey from 2003 until 2007. She has published many articles and papers on Channel Islands archaeology. Hi, Heather. <laughs> uh, we're also looking to be joined by Alex Fitzpatrick. Alex is a zoo archaeologist who is just finishing her PhD at the University of Bradford, where she works with faunal bones, meaning bones of animals rather than humans. She is currently researching faunal bones found in the Cowsey Caves in Scotland, investigating how they may have been used in prehistoric funerary rituals. Alex is also one of the hosts of the Archaeo Animals podcast on the Archaeology Podcast Network and was previously a writer for the YouTube series Eons for PBS Digital Studios. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here today and welcome. <laughs> So the young producers have been talking amongst ourselves and we've got three questions that we were all keen to ask both of you just to get things started off um, and to get to know you a little bit better and to give a bit more of an insight into the kinds of work that you both do and how you got there. So uh, we thought maybe we could start with the question, what first got you interested in archaeology? And whichever of you wants to start off. Uh, Heather, you, you can start, Heather. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Uh, it is a very good question. I was thinking about this just before we came on air. Um, I was always interested in being outside and I loved uh, natural things like stones and, you know, being by water and walking. I grew up this, uh, very close to a beach, which was fantastic. So I used to love walking along the beach and picking up stones and things. And then I think um, as I got slightly older and went to uh, um, the secondary school, um, I got more and more interested in the classical world. I did Latin from quite an early age and sort of was interested in the Greeks and Romans. But then um, I realized there was so much archeology span in the British Isles, never mind uh, in classical Greece and Rome. And I actually uh, had a very good school friend and the two of us went on our first dig in uh, the city of Gloucester a very long time ago. And it was a Roman dig. So there were lots of, uh, lots of finds in, and we, I remember vividly, we excavated a, a timber lined well, you know, to, that had water at the bottom of it. And the preservation was so good. There were whole Roman pots coming out. And I was, I can't remember what age I was, but I was about 17 probably. And it was just so thrilling. And I think that's the message to get across that archaeology is very exciting. Uh, I have two sons and they used to joke with me that I find everything exciting, but <laughs> archaeology is very exciting because there's always something different to find out. And I think the thing you have to remember is it's not just about stones and bones, if I may, <laughs> Alex, and, and, you know, <laughs> digging up ancient pottery. It's actually about the people that, whose, whose artifacts and remains that we're looking at. And in a way, they were just like us. They just lived a long time ago and they had different technology. So at the risk of sounding corny, um, <laughs> she's very exciting. <laughs> I think it gets right to the heart of, uh, yeah, why we're all so interested in archaeology and relating to people and that kind of thing, totally. And um, what about you, Alex? Is it something comparable for you? Um, I was shown Indiana Jones at a way too young age, uh, and I got really into it to the point that I must have been like seven years old. I went out and dug a two foot hole in my backyard mm -hmm. and then I got in trouble. By my parents so I went to my best friend's house and dug a two foot hole in her backyard and then I was just not allowed to do that anymore so I guess to make all of that punishment worth it I decided to go into archaeology but like really <laughs> uh I I was really into history uh growing up and I was really into the sciences and stuff when I went to college uh in New York um Archaeology in the States is more anthropology based. So I did a lot of anthropology stuff. I was really into the, that kind of cultural uh, study type things, uh, but I still really wanted the sciences of it. So I ended up coming here to the UK and uh, I ended up being able to kind of use some of the biology background I had from high school uh, and became really into zoo archaeology. So um, yeah, I just really like dead animals, so. <laughs> right at the heart of it that, that's yeah really and it, it, this is like the socially acceptable way to deal with it so <laughs> nice you've got your yeah. niche yeah <laughs> cool um our second question is um is being an archaeologist everything you thought it would be so for both both of you being so interested in stuff when you were growing up is, is that the reality for you nowadays well, I think like any job, I, I mean, you know, I said, obviously it was exciting and everything, and it is, but like any job, there is a sort of more humdrum, tedious side to it, you know, the everyday, <laughs> if you like. And, um, but I think the other thing about archaeology is there's so many different aspects to it. Uh, and since that long time ago, when I did my first excavation, it, uh, as Alex will know, it's become very much a science and, and the whole world of science has developed in the time that I've been working and particularly with computer technology and we're having a, a digital festival today, which is fantastic. And of course this wouldn't have been possible. I don't know how many years ago, but uh, the technology of, of, of um, computing has, has you know, changed every aspect of science really. So um, you can do all sorts of different things and still be an archeologist if you like. But from, for myself, I did quite a lot of excavation uh, in years gone by, and you mentioned that I worked in the Channel Islands, and that was really interesting because it had a bit of a French influence because the islands are very close to France. So it was all, that was all very interesting. And when I came to work for English Heritage, 
I was working more with historic sites and, and now Stonehenge itself, which of course is <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> it never ceases to disappoint. So um, there are exciting times, but there, there is more sort of mundane stuff in between, particularly if you've worked on an excavation, because what we call the post excavation, in other words, when you finish digging, you have all the very fine work of looking at what you've dug up and looking at the stratigraphy, that means the sort of level everything was dug up from. Uh, so there's lots of work that you would do at your computer or in your study and, and looking at books, got lots of books behind me here as you can see. <laughs> um, so there's that aspect to it as well. So um, yes, it is exciting, but there's a lot of um, you know more tedious stuff in between if you like. <laughs> Yeah, and that's not necessarily the stuff that gets presented to us on television. That's exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about for you, Alex? And just a reminder as well to everyone, um, ask your own questions as well in the in the comments section below. Uh, we'll come to those in the end after the quiz. Yeah, Alex, what about for you? Um, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, obviously I, I have traveled because of archaeology, which was like the big allure for me, especially coming from the States where I think less people tend to travel to other countries just because we're a bit, you know, we're not right right next to Europe or whatever. Um, so like that was like a big deal. Um, otherwise, like, I think I wasn't prepared for the amount of math I was allowed to do. Uh, I was really excited to not have to look at numbers when I started doing archeology span and my whole life is num numbers now and spreadsheets is very sad. <laughs> <laughs> just I can't believe I have to count things it's horrible but um yeah no it's just it, it is it's great uh I know Heather was talking about pokes post x as being the kind of tedious work that's where I thrive as a zoo archaeologist because I hate excavating <laughs> cool <laughs> I don't like being outside so like right now it's been me thriving um <laughs> So yeah, I, I just want to sit in the lab and have people send me uh, bones and that'll be, that's me sorted. Oh, cool. That's really nice, actually, seeing like the two sides of the industry. Yeah, no, definitely. Stuff that doesn't necessarily get seen as well, like, nice. <laughs> um, our third question as well for you both. Um, we we're all wondering what do you reckon are the best and the worst bits of your roles, but I suppose to some degree you did just answer that. But <laughs> Yeah, what are the best things, I suppose, like best finds that you've had, that kind of thing? Uh, well, in terms of best finds, I was lucky enough to dig up a, a hoard of Roman coins, um, about 400 coins all uh, deposited in a huge big pot. That was quite exciting. Um, oh. they, they weren't silver, they were little tiny, tiny ones. That was in a site in North London, in Enfield in North London. That was quite exciting. But when I worked in the Channel Islands, we find what's called a warrior burial. So that was an Iron Age site. So around about 100 BC and um, a chieftain or a chieftainess, we're not quite sure <laughs> whether it was male or female because um, the uh, soil in the Channel Islands is very acidic because the underlying rock is granite and the soil bones uh, don't survive in that sort of soil, they rot away. So um, we only find traces of metalwork, but the, the whoever was buried there had a shield and a sword and a lovely brooch holding on what we assume was a tunic. So that was very exciting. So that's the sort of highs and then the lows are um, that it's very often I'm working outside. Now, I do like being outside, but let's face it, the weather here in Britain is very erratic. And not only that, but because for health and safety reasons, we have to wear a lot of kit. So very often I'm wearing a hard hat. Here I am in my English heritage hard hat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is, um, you know, we used to joke there's nothing glamorous about archaeology <laughs> and um, quite often I have to wear a high vis jacket, high visibility jacket that stands for and I have one here that actually says Stonehenge and has the English heritage website. They were wrong when they said there was no glamour, I don't know what they were talking about. <laughs> and then quite often I'm, you know, I'm wearing a sort of work shirt so you could see but uh, quite often I'm wearing waterproofs, you know, and all the rest of it but I don't really mind but I suppose and, and quite often you get quite muddy and everything and I brought along my trial to show everybody so this is what I actually dig with. This is actually quite a big one, I haven't used this one very much. Um, but it is, the excavation is a very physical thing and it doesn't suit everyone um, but I really enjoyed it. I haven't done so much recently but I did really enjoy it but you have to be prepared to be out in all weathers. <laughs> 
while you're doing it. Definitely. Yeah, and I suppose that makes it all the more exciting when you don't have to do it all the time as well. Like just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Alex? Uh, I mean, it's for me, excavation is the downside. I think maybe because I've had the bad luck of working in some of the most difficult areas. So I've uh, done excavations in the Orkney Isles, where a lot of it is um, rescue archaeology. So it's a lot of, you know, working uh, to beat the or sea changes and erosion of sites. So it's you're usually working in a very uh, swamp, well not swampy, but like completely flooded area. And then the other site that I'm currently working on are Cowsey Caves and those you have to like scale the cliffs to get to and I'm claustrophobic and I have afraid of, I'm afraid of heights. Uh, so this was like my, my nightmare come to life. And uh, I did actually go and I did excavate, I faced my fears and I promptly fell off a boulder and had to go to a &E on day one. <laughs> Because oh, no. we all thought I broke my arm and we I didn't, but I was like, I'm not going back to site again. I'm just going to work from base camp and do the funnel bones. Yeah, uh, I completely understand the like, enthusiasm for the lab now. <laughs> yeah, I have a great picture that I think I'm going to end up using in my PhD thesis, where it's me with my arm in a sling, just like <laughs> with, with my kit on too. So I have my helmet on and I've got all my stuff on. Uh, but yeah, um, otherwise, like, I think the best thing is I like that archaeology is always kind of a mystery, especially if you work with um, bones. And I actually have props too. So this is what I wish every bone looks like. So this is a uh, fifth century <laughs> boar skull that I actually have tattooed on me too, because it's so cool. And um, that's what that's a full skull. But unfortunately, what you usually end up getting is something like this which is just the top half of the frontal part of a cow skull, which is actually pulled out from the Thames. Um, so I like the mystery aspect of kind of getting these like puzzle pieces and then figuring out where it's from and like, you know, what it was used for. You won't be able to see on the camera really, but there's little cut marks on here showing that it was used for butchery, things like that. Um, I just find that stuff really exciting. And oh, cool. I just yeah. dropped it. Whoops, well, it's fine. Making around something and that kind of thing, cool. All right, well, thank you both so much for that as well. It was really useful, like insight into what you get up to. And um, I think it's a good shout now if we start to move into the quiz section of the session. So just remind everyone who is watching at home, you can put any more questions in the comments at any point during this live stream. We'll be monitoring it throughout and building a list of questions for the Q&A at the end, which will take place after the quiz. Um, and we're about to go through 10 questions. So if you join the quiz using a website called Slido, you type in that event code there, 33905. We will go through 10 questions, <coughs> multiple choice. The first five will be from Heather, followed by another five from Alex. All of the questions are multiple choice, so you can participate using the website. And um, this should bring up Heather and Alex's questions. So you tap each response as it's asked um, in turn. Slido also shows a leaderboard of the top five quizzes as well, so if you're feeling a little bit competitive, we have got you covered today, <laughs> uh, but if you're not feeling very competitive, that is also totally okay. Um, if you have any problems using Slido or can't use Slido at the same time as the live stream, you can just use a notepad to keep track. Um, or write your answers in the comments section as well, and let us know how you get on at the end of the quiz, please. Do put it in the comments section. And remember, if you do think of any more questions throughout the quiz, if any of the quiz questions prompt any thoughts, just pop them in the comments again. Okay, Heather, so we're going to start with your questions now, if you want to take it away. Okay, so the first question is, how old do you think the Stonehenge Stone Circle is? Is it 100 years old, 4,000 years old, 200 years old, or 5 million years old? Ooh. I am taking part myself. I've got a little note. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to keep my answer to myself. <laughs> Do each of those answers like equate to a different period as well? Like what would 4,000 years ago be or 5 million years ago? Uh, 4,000 would be the Neolithic. 5 okay. million would be a <laughs> um, very long time ago. It would be... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, well, oh, if I give you the answer to that, it's a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
So I'll move on to the second question swiftly. <laughs> Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, fab. Ah, goodness me. Lots of people <coughs> have gone for 4,000 years. Interesting. <laughs> oh, wow. Very well done. 100% very impressive. Nice one, everyone at home. Excellent. Okay. Okay. We've got a leaderboard. Oh, oh, so it gives you the times as well, Slido. I should have mentioned that. We've got Emma straight in with 12 seconds. Oh, no, it's a tie between Emma and Amy. And um, yeah, so this is one to look out for in future, guys, when you get the questions. Dive as soon as you get a vague idea about what it might be. <laughs> wow, it is competitive. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have your finger on the buzzer, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Family fortunes. <laughs> okay, so it's question two. Okay, what is grooved wear? Not groovy wear, but grooved wear. Is it a type of clothing? A type of pottery? Is it a decorated metal sword or swords? Or is it a type of knitting? This just gave me flashbacks to my undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh no. <laughs> no offense, of course. <laughs> but I've, I've moved on from material goods to uh, bones. <laughs> <laughs> and no option for uh, very early disco outfits either, I see. So I'm just stumped. <laughs> <laughs> they have actually got Bronze Age skirts in Denmark because they're so well preserved. They in the peat box and uh, in the museum in Denmark, they actually have Bronze Age skirts. They almost look as if they've been knitted. Oh, wow. Uh, they're okay, fantastic. So <laughs> it's like- 100% response again there for a type of pottery. Um, what was the correct answer? Oh, interesting. They've all been doing their homework. <laughs> yeah, oh, congratulations to everyone, nice. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm just glad I know the uh, the answers to this because I, that's all I was thinking about was oh gosh they're gonna do a quiz and I'm not gonna know any of the answers to not my questions <laughs> <laughs> oh congratulations Emma it's still in the top spot nice one quick off the mark well done <laughs> okay ready for question three okay so where is the site of Stonehenge is it in England is it in Scotland? Is it on the moon? Or is it in France? Where this question is wrong because it, there should be in America, of course, where it <laughs> yes. is. Well, yes, it's almost a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I should have said, where is the real Stonehenge? <laughs> How dare you, Carhenge is so real. <laughs> I was talking about lots of replicas of Stonehenge that there are all around the world, but particularly in America. Because uh, my claim to shame is that I have yet to go to Stonehenge in uh, here. <laughs> oh, 100%. Cool. Okay. <laughs> oh, made these too easy. <laughs> well, then, everyone at home, it all hangs in the balance on the uh, speed on the button. Oh. <laughs> Dining, nice one. Very good, very good. <laughs> okay. So what did the people who built Stonehenge eat? Was it nuts and berries? Bread and cheese? Roast pork? Or Kentucky fried chicken? Mm. I mean, together it all sounds like a fantastic buffet. But yeah. <laughs> individually, <laughs> I'm less sure. <laughs> and when you find out what the people who built Stonehenge ate, is it purely from remains of the food or do you find skeletons and it's that kind of thing? Well, actually, what we know about Stonehenge is that nobody was actually living there. Mm -hmm. But um, quite a few years ago, um, uh, well, it's about seven or eight years ago now, there was an excavation done at Durrington Walls and the Neolithic village was found there. Uh, when I say village, there were floor plans of floor plans, sorry, so the plan of lots of houses from the Neolithic period. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of debris from what the people were eating. 
um i won't say it just yet because <laughs> <laughs> but, not everyone's answer in so i think you can reveal we've got 60 okay on well it was actually the answer i was looking for was roast pork believe it or not because there was a huge amount of uh animal bone and particularly pig bone found at darrington walls in this neolithic village that was excavated uh, a few years ago uh, and it looked as if there were very large deposits, as if there'd been people, they were almost like what we would call feasting, or as you said, having a buffet, or, you know, almost like having a celebration. Uh, and uh, scientists have been able to find out a huge amount from those pig bones about how old the pigs were when they were slaughtered and eaten, uh, and, um, and lots of other things, which Alex will know more about than I do. Um, so they were, they had a varied diet, uh, but it was roast pork in particular. They seemed to have been eating a lot of pig meat. And we wonder whether they were perhaps celebrating at times of the year when they perhaps made a big effort to erect part of Stonehenge. That's what we think. Okay. Oh, fan fascinating, truly. Yeah. And fantastic find of Jonathan Wars as well. I didn't realize it was quite that recent. Yeah, so I'm sorry if that was a bit confusing, that question. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. Oh, well done to Stephen Liu, who got in straight away on that one. Fantastic. Well, good news is that I might have a question that's very similar to that question. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys can make up the points if you didn't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> So we've just had the solstice a few weeks ago, which is uh, the, when it marks Midsummer Day. Uh, so how do you think people who lived at the time of Stonehenge told the time or worked out what the time was? With a watch, with an egg timer, by watching the sun, or from the moon? I'm... Hmm, stuck between two there myself. Two, well, two, yeah. I'm just realizing I made my questions really hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, but perhaps mine <laughs> get everybody warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> Yours are a bit, probably a bit more serious. Oh, okay, cool. So we've got 100% of people said by watching the sun. Well done, everyone. I mean, you know, to be honest, we're not sure that they actually told the time in the same way that we think of telling the time. But we know that Stonehenge was built to respect the midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset. So we know those people were measuring the sun, watching the sun, and they probably had clever people like we would call astronomers, um, you know, whose maybe whose job it was to measure the passage of time. Uh, they did take respect of the moon as well, but it's much harder because the cycle of the moon is much longer and it, it's not so obvious as the uh, as the sun, the movements of the sun, which of course give us daylight and, you know, it's either light or it's dark. So well done, everybody. Um, we're fairly sure that they perhaps not told the time in the way we think of it, but they certainly knew about the movements of the sun. Okay. Oh, cool. Well, congratulations to everyone who got that right. And yeah, it's at least something that is comparable. I suppose we can't impose the a whole watch idea onto that. Oh, Stephen Liu again in the lead. Nice. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is that all five of your questions that we've gone through there, Heather? Yes, it is. Yeah. All right. Now for my super hard questions. Well, actually, not that hard. I'm just being excited. Uh, in what time period do we have the earliest evidence for chickens in Britain? Is it the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, or the Iron Age? Ooh, okay. So what kind of periods are, well, how long ago were each of those periods for us? Are you able to like clarify what, what was the Mesolithic, for example? Um, I am very bad at remembering how long ago, uh, but Mesolithic would have come first, then the Neolithic, also known as kind of the Stone Age, when we have uh, agriculture gets uh, starts, and then the Bronze Age and Iron Age are kind of self-explanatory. Uh, but yeah, no, um, uh, I mean, we talked about before, but Neolithic's about 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Uh, and then uh, because of all the numbers, I can't, <laughs> I couldn't tell you. I'm so bad. <laughs> Never ask me for dates. I'm just like. <laughs> so off the top of my head, I think the Iron Age ended in like 100 AD. Is 
that right? I'm not 100 sure. That's that's the most recent you were saying. Yeah, and out of all these, yeah. Okay, cool. So that is the one that we've got the least votes for. So what was the correct answer there? Oh, oh, and it was the Iron Age. Yeah, it's not as early as I think a lot of people think. And uh, personally speaking, I was really excited because uh, I thought I found the earliest chicken, which turned out to be medieval. And I was very disappointed and I'm still sad about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, congratulations, Stephen Lou, sitting in the hot spot that's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so on to question two. Yeah, see, I did make these kind of hard. Uh, which of the following bones is unique to birds? Is the is it the tarso metatarsus, the fibula, the caudal vertebrae, or the premaxilla? Ooh. Um, can you give us an Ooh, idea where any, of those, <laughs> yeah, where any of those would be located on a bird? So tarso metatarsus would be more in the limb region. So with a fibula, a vertebr caudal vertebra is at the end of your your spine, and the premaxilla is found in your skull. Okay. Mm. okay. So we've got a bit of a spread across the answers there. I think everyone knew the fibula was a human bone. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess birds have one as well, is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like a little tiny bone that's just off it's hard to explain because birds are weird creatures uh <laughs> is it on the wing for them then you mentioned it would be like on the limbs or oh uh, tarso metatarsus uh um, would be more on the limbs uh and right. that would actually if i can say it yeah it, it, that would be the bone that's unique to birds uh and the only reason why i made that question is because on my last ex excavation I was given a bone that they thought was human because of how big it was. It was like a foot long. And I was just like, that's a tarso metatarsus. That's a bird. <laughs> it's a really big bird. Really big bird. It, it, it turned out to be a crane, but it was very cool to find because uh, it, it is just massive in comparison. Yeah. Oh, oh congratulations to Emma, who's uh, pipped okay. again. <laughs> nice. Um, so should we move on to question three, I think, of your quiz? questions yeah how many bones make up the average fish skull is it 22 130 one or 72 mm. Ugh, fish are the bane of my existence sometimes <laughs> <laughs> do you deal with a lot of fish when you're up at the county caves um uh, surprisingly not as much uh my master's dissertation was entirely on fish and then i realized i had my fill of fish they're too, they're too small and finicky. <laughs> Especially when you've got foot long bird bones to deal with by the sounds of things. Yeah, no, I, there's, there's a lot going on. I love being a zoo archaeologist, but it is, you have to know so much. So it can be kind of stressful. Uh, and I am a very stressed out person all the time, which uh, <laughs> probably comes off on the video. <laughs> <laughs> so how many bones are there in the average fish skull? Again, we've got quite a broad spread across all the answers. Tie between 22 and 100. 30. I mean, yeah, no, 22 is funny because that's the amount of bones that make up the human skull, yeah. but the answer is 130, oh also known goodness. as too many. There's just too many, <laughs> there's too many bones. <laughs> a fish is basically a head and a tail, so. Yeah, very true. <laughs> oh, Emily, Emily is a number one now. Um, oh, has Emily beaten it for the last couple of questions? Uncertain. So question four. So how did the great auk finally go extinct in the British Isles? Was it hunted for food, killed for display in a museum, died naturally in a zoo, or was it killed for being a witch? So it, am I right in thinking the great auk was a bird? Yeah, it was a seabird that was kind of close to like a puffin type bird. Uh, it was found mostly up in the isles, uh, like or the Orkneys, um, a, a bit more up north, uh, around that kind of area. And uh, it went extinct in, I believe, the 17th century, more or less. Okay. Oh, okay. So most people think it was hunted for food. Um, killed for display in a museum is the second answer. Mm. What is the actual answer? It was killed for being a witch. Wow. 
wow, the last great orcs were killed for being witches. Yeah, it was tied up, to, two sailors tied it up uh, to the mast of a ship and then a maelstrom happened and they thought the great orc caused the maelstrom because it was a witch, so it killed. they killed it for that. Oh my god, pure great, poor great orc. Yeah. yeah. I know, I didn't deserve that. Yeah, <laughs> and being a witch is cool, so I don't understand why they would do that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Emily is in first place again after our slightly traumatic Great Orc question, actually. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> sorry for bringing it down. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to the last question. <laughs> yeah, so this one, this one's just going to be asking if you paid attention to the earlier questions. <laughs> Oh, that happened. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, which animal appears to be the main food of choice during the late Neolithic fe feasts at Stonehenge? Is it red deer, cattle, pigs, or fish? Ooh. I suspect. <laughs> Fingers crossed people remember. Um, and remember, if this quiz has spurred any questions for you, just go ahead and pop them in the comments section. We will be moving on to the Q&A um, straight after the quiz, just in a couple of minutes. Ooh, pigs has come out. Mm -hmm. Number one. Oh, that's correct. Cool. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice memories for everyone. <laughs> How did everyone do at home? Do let us know in the comment section and add your name and age if you like. Um, but thank you so much, Heather and Alex, for some great quiz questions there. Uh, I know I feel like I learned a lot. Um, yeah, as well as being minutely upset by the story of the great orc. But I hope everyone else had uh, fun at home as well. Uh, let's turn things around now and get the audience some answers to their questions. We've been compiling a list of questions from everyone as the session has gone on, but we will be taking submissions right through the end, until the end of the live stream. So um, yeah, if Heather or Alex mention anything that you'd like to know more about, or if you come up with any extra questions, do go ahead and just drop them in the comments and we'll see what else we get as we go along. Um, okay, so I've got a first question here for Alex. Um, so how easy is it to study archaeology? Do you have to be really clever to do it? I struggle at school but I'm really interested in it. Do you have any advice there? Um, I was always kind of a iffy student, um, especially when it came to the sciences. Even though I really enjoyed biology and things like that, uh, I was incredibly bad in chemistry and lab hard lab sciences uh, so that was like when I moved to the UK to do my master's in archaeological sciences I was really nervous about that because uh, I was I, I could not tell you what an electron is um, and to be honest I still could not tell you what an electron is but it's fine <laughs> um, but you know it's just kind of doing the work and like making sure that if there are places that I felt iffy about I uh, either sought help or whatever um, you know like as long as you do the work it's it's fine and I I mean I I did it and uh, I still don't know what an electron is so let me be your inspiration. <laughs> do you have anything to add there as well Heather? Yes I mean there are very there are lots of different ways you can get into archaeology it depends whether you want to make a career out of it and uh, as I was saying before, there are lots of different aspects. So you could be very good at the physical act of digging and, you know, you could be quite strong and enjoy being outside and you could train to do practical archaeology. Or um, if you just wanted to be a volunteer, for example, there's lots of volunteering uh, opportunities, particularly through organisations like English Heritage and uh, the CBA, the Council for British Archaeology, who are hosting the festival um, so that would be one way and it, it, it'd be quite good to go and volunteer in an excavation like I did when I was in my teens because it gives you an insight as to what it's all about really and um, uh, whether you really would enjoy it or not um, there's obviously a lot of archaeology on television these days but that tends to be the highlights of everything that's going on so again as I was saying you know there is a tedious side to it as well but there's lots of different aspects. You could go down the scientific route or you could go down the more historical route where you learn about different civilizations. And of course there's British archeology, span but then there's archeology span all around the world as well. So there's lots of different ways to get in, but I would certainly recommend that everyone 
tries volunteering to start with to get an idea of what it's really like. Yeah, yeah. And then understanding kind of which route you want to go down from there, I suppose, like the only way to know is through doing. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Um, I've got another question for both of you from Liz, um, who asks, what has been a particularly challenging interaction you've had with the public relating to archaeological sites you've worked on? And what did you do in that situation? Uh, oh, and that's directed to both of you. I'm sure Heather has like more to talk about with Stonehenge, because I'm <laughs> sure that's just, you know. <laughs> Sorry, can I just clarify again? You said challenging um, the, the bit with the public. Sorry, could you, would you mind just saying that again? Yeah. Um, what has been a particularly challenging interaction you've had with the public relating to archaeological sites that you've worked on? And what did you do? Well, yeah, Stonehenge is a good example. <laughs> um, it, it, it does attract a lot of people. Um, obviously, lots and lots of people want to come and visit it, but lots of people are very interested in the site generally, and not least because it does have this astronomical association with the solstices and the equinoxes, and we're fairly sure it was built to respect um, the movements of the sun and the moon. Um, so, um, and then there's the archeological world. So there's the archeological story of, of the time when it was built in the Neolithic, it then has a whole history of its own because I think one of the really amazing things about Stonehenge is that it survives at all. Uh, you know, the stones are massive, so they're not the sort of thing you could just put in your pocket and take away. <laughs> or even if you were breaking them up for, you know, building a wall or something, it would be a lot of effort. So we think that's one reason why it does more or less survive. But, you know, if you think uh, through all the time of the Roman period, the Iron Age period, the Roman period, the early medieval period, all those people who came and went respected Stonehenge. But in the modern world, there are a lot of people who have a lot of alternative ideas about Stonehenge and don't really want to believe any of the archaeological story. They're convinced, there's a lot of people who are convinced that it's, uh, you know, it could be a computer or a, 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 the equivalent of a watch measuring time. Um, people, there are people for whom it's a deeply spiritual site and they really believe it's their place of worship. So it, it is very challenging balancing all these different aspects of Stonehenge. But I have to be honest, we do get occasional people who just keep on writing and saying, but this is the answer to Stonehenge. Why don't you believe me? You know, and they'll have lots of different theories that don't really match up with what we consider is the archeological story. So yeah, that can be quite challenging. Yeah, I'm sure being diplomatic in, in the face of that. Exactly, yeah. that's the word, diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got another question um, for both of you from Lucy. Where would be your dream place to work Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, I often used to think I'd love to go and like work in Egypt or somewhere, but actually uh, I'm not very good in heat. So the British climate probably <laughs> suits me quite well. So, you know, I don't like to say I'm lucky to work at Stonehenge, but I am, you know, I do, you know, it is an amazing place to work. Um, mm. and uh, obviously I've had to work hard <laughs> in my own career, but it's a very nice place to work um, because it's so iconic and so many people do want to come and, and visit it. So. <laughs> oh, so it turns out the grass is greener right here. That's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Where there is grass, I suppose, you don't get so much in Egypt, so perfectly. <laughs> what about you, Alex? I have always said that I want to uh, excavate Disneyland. Um, I am a big theme park person, uh, especially coming from living in the United States. Uh, and I, even on my blog, uh, which is animalarchaeology.com, just putting a plug there, um, I, I, I like to do uh, kind of like theoretical archaeology of theme parks because I find that really fascinating, the idea of these very uh, intentionally built places that have an intentional type of almost archaeology built into them. Uh, because of the way many of the more immersive theme parks work in terms of trying to immerse into a story and set up a narrative just from uh, an atmosphere. So I, I always find the idea of 
excavating a theme park to be extremely fascinating. So I guess my dream excavation would mean I'd have to fast forward like a hundred years or something. I don't know, however long Disney lasts. <laughs> yeah, and kind of uncover that story in hindsight and play mm. it off the narrative that is presented around it, yeah. Oh, really interesting. Like another like, different kind of archaeology as well. Yeah. So I've got another question for you, Heather, from Liz, who says, um, was there also lipid analysis done on ceramics at Stonehenge that showed cheese making? Or am I thinking of another site? Actually, there was. Uh, and um, yeah, I probably that probably was a bit confusing, that question about the diet, for which I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, it's really interesting because, again, flagging up the scientific side of archaeology, uh, what people, scientists can do now is trace deposits um, inside some of that pottery we were talking about, the grooved ware. And if you think if you wash some dishes by hand that you've used yourself in your own sink, you know, it's quite hard to get them really spotlessly clean, isn't it? Um, sometimes you might have a smear of something left on your plate or whatever. And that's exactly what we find from those people who lived all that time ago. And scientists are able to analyze uh, the deposits and particularly lipids, which um, uh, come from um, uh, animal residues and particularly from milk products, for want of a better expression. Uh, and, and, but also, I hope I'm right in saying, Alex, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think from some of the uh, work on uh, bone remains that they've been able to tell that people might have been intolerant to um, to milk. So in other words, uh, mm -hmm. milk wouldn't have agreed with them. Um, a bit like today, some people have allergies, but mm -hmm. they think the, the milk was converted into what we would call cheese or curds. And there is some evidence for people eating that. Um, so yes, that is true actually. Yeah. Oh, wow, that is fascinating. I'm really interesting that you can come across that from pottery and those kinds of things. Like, I'm sure a lot of us can empathise, particularly with things like cheese getting baked onto plates and that kind of stuff, like digging away at the oils and yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And Alex, do you have anything to add there? No, I mean that's kind of covers it, and it's it is really interesting all the stuff that you can. Because uh, I had a colleague of mine who uh, was doing her PhD on ceramics, and just everything you can find out from lipid uh, and residue analysis is amazing. Uh, and how I mean, even the micro kind of analysis that you can even do with uh, animal bone, including ice type isotope analysis and all that other stuff that goes over my head because I don't know how to work anything. Uh, it's just is wild and I think that's why I love archaeology so much is that you can really as technology uh, and methodology advances we can really take the smallest thing and really like bring out as much information as possible from it. Oh yeah fantastic and that's where the science comes in I suppose that we don't yeah. necessarily associate with it. Yeah. Um, so I've got a question again for both of you from Lucy, who asks, while lots of heritage sites and museums are still closed, what would you recommend doing at home to learn more about archaeology, things that would be useful for applying to university or for work experience? Well, uh, <laughs> again, because we're having a digital festival, um, it, there is a huge amount of archaeological resor resource sorry, on the internet. Um, not least English heritage itself, but if it's somebody that wants to think about studying stone, uh, sorry, archaeology in general, <laughs> you have got Stonehenge on the brain, sorry. Um, you know, most of the universities that have archaeology departments have websites and you'd be able to find out quite a lot about what you would need to uh, get into a university and there'd be lots about their research on there. And a lot of the major institutions have um, their collections online so you might be able to look at archaeology collections from different museums even you know major ex uh, institutions like the British Museum but smaller ones as well. Uh, there is a huge amount out there and there are lots of organizations there's one called the Prehistoric Society for example who have websites who post lots of information so um, there really is a lot of information there and I think there's a lot of people could find out about just from working on their own computers. 
Definitely. And I think it's a really, really encouraging thing to see um, so many digital things like that have come to fill in this little void that we've got, I suppose, while those places are closed. It's a really big time for innovation. Mm. What about you, Alex? Would you say? Yeah, I mean, also just there's loads of people, especially with, you know, YouTube and podcasts becoming a huge thing. Um, there's people like uh, Amelia the Archaeologist and Dig It With Raven, uh, who are doing videos about archaeology. Um, I, like we mentioned at the beginning, I have a podcast called Archaeo Animals, which is on the Archaeology Podcast Network, which has loads of different shows on there. Uh, there's also other podcasts out there, like the Ark and Anth podcast um, that is doing really good work in showcasing just how diverse uh, our fields can be, uh, which I think is a really good uh, thing, especially if you're just going to university and thinking about studying archaeology, because um, it's something that I noticed when I first started archaeology is I thought there's only one way to do archaeology. I was when I did my undergrad, I was a classical archaeologist learning how to do pottery uh, analysis and all the other uh, fun stuff. Um, but uh, then I moved to the UK and realized that there's so much more you can do in archaeology, not even just with the hard sciences, but with also kind of more ethnographic, anthropological approaches to it. Um, so I think just kind of getting a handle on what's out there and what you can do as an archaeologist and like learning that at an early part of your life is probably really uh, good and something I wish that I kind of knew when I got into the field. Um, but yeah, no, I think that like all these like YouTube and podcasts and stuff like that, uh, showcasing these kind of diverse approaches and diverse archaeologists too, uh, is a great place to start. Oh, fantastic. And then to sum that up, I suppose, going into volunteering when we get out of this situation as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can access that, that kind of volunteering. I noticed we had a question about volunteering, um, but we don't have much time left. Um, so any quick things to sum up, like where are the best ways to get involved with volunteering and that kind of thing? Well, English Heritage certainly has a volunteer uh, program uh, and um, the Council for British Archaeology, the CBA, uh, uh, sorry, advertises excavations, for example, uh, on their website that people could go and join. Uh, and I know the National Trust have volunteers as well, and they do some archaeology, they have archaeological people working for them. So, yes, I think, you know, a, a search would probably find quite a few different opportunities. Fantastic. Cool. So get a hold on those digital resources. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, so we are coming to the end of the session now um, and we just have a couple of extra things before we finish because we are really interested to hear what everyone else thought of the event today. Um, so the first of those is a very short poll. It's only three questions long and we'll only take a couple of minutes um, and it will be really useful for the Council for British Archaeology um, who would like to gather a little bit of feedback about this. So it's going to be in Slido again just as the quiz was earlier and the code this time is there on screen so it's 84794. I'll just get for everyone a little bit of time to access the Slido link um, and thank you so much to everyone who is volunteering their feedback for us here as well. It is hugely appreciated and um, as we've just been talking about it's quite different gauging everyone's reactions in this kind of format. Um, so however we can do that is really worthwhile. Um, okay so the first poll question um, will be coming up in just a moment and that is how would you rate your enjoyment? So this one is a scalable response. Um, so if you answer with a one, that would mean that you didn't really enjoy it very much, whereas a five would mean that you really enjoyed it. Okay. Um, yeah, so everyone will have about 30 seconds to answer each of these questions, just as we did for the quiz before. So just ticking over while people put in their, their <laughs> answers, which is really appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, okay. Okay, so the second question should have appeared for everyone now, and that's a yes or a no question. Did you learn anything new? OK, 
Okay. And then the third question will be another yes or no question and is asking you if you would like to take part in any events within the Festival of Archaeology again in the future. Okay, so everyone should have those polls all going through and thank you so much um, for giving us your feedback. It's really, really generous. Um, I know there's a couple of Slido things going on there, Slido magic in the background, but there we go. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with. Um, Fantastic. Okay, so thank you again to everyone for completing the poll. And the second thing is just a reminder that we are running a survey with a potential £50 prize for any that have been completed. Um, so the link for that will appear right at the end of this live stream session, just after I've said all the thank yous and goodbyes and that kind of thing. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who has been getting involved throughout the live stream. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the quiz in the first half and are still either basking in glory about how you did or are busy not feeling too bruised and saying it's fine it's fine <laughs> um, <laughs> fingers crossed as well that you've gained some useful insights into the life of a 21st century archaeologist like Alex and like Heather um, and that everyone's come away with something to think about and um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Shout Out Loud and the Council for British Archaeology for putting this event on and a huge thank you to our two guest experts, Dr Heather Sabir from English Heritage and zoo archaeologist Alex Fitzpatrick. Thank you both so much for being here. <laughs> I know I've really enjoyed it and have learned a lot so um, hopefully it's been the same for everyone joining at home. Thank you both so much. <laughs>